index journal and the doctor i invite dr manpreet manpreet singh the topic is he will be going to highlight about about pulmonary function test and their clinical implications dr manpreet singh good morning everybody and my topic is pulmonary function test and their interpretation for anesthesia i am manpreet singh from department of anesthesia and intensive care government medical college chandigarh the if you see this topic this topic is very important for the post graduates as each and every examination whether it is dnb whether it is md whether it is diploma everywhere this topic is asked in detail and pulmonary function test is a generic name used to indicate a battery of studies or maneuvers that may be performed using standardized equipment to measure the lung function it evaluates one or more aspects of the respiratory system that is respiratory mechanics lung parenchymal function or gas exchange then cardiopulmonary interactions what are the indications there are certain diagnostic indications and certain prognostic indications if you see that diagnostic indications are the evaluation of signs and symptoms or breathlessness or chronic cough or there is a exertional dyspnea then you should go for it or there is a screening at the risk at risk patients then there is a measurement of the effect of drugs on the pulmonary function and to assess the pre operative risk and monitor the pulmonary drug toxicity then if in the prognosis it assesses the severity and follows the response of the therapy follow response of the therapy is very important that can be judged with the uh, pulmonary function test then it determines further treatment goals and evaluates the degree of disability there are certain guidelines like tc guidelines which was given in 1979 and american college of physicians they have given the guidelines that when you have to order pre operatively the pfds it is not like that that the patient comes to you with any of the lung diseases or problems of the respiratory system you go with the pft whenever there is an age of more than 70 obese patients thoracic surgery upper abdominal surgery history of cough or smoking or any pulmonary disease then you should go with the the pre operative pfts american college of physicians they gave the guidelines whenever there is a lung resection history of smoking or dyspnea cardiac surgery upper abdominal surgery or lower abdominal surgery uncharacteristic characterized pulmonary disease then you should go with the Uh, pfts contraindications are when there is a recent eye surgery thoracic abdominal cerebral aneurysms active hemoptysis pneumothorax unstable angina or recent mi within one month the there is a categorization of pft these are first uh, categorized into mechanical or ventilatory functions of lung or chest wall that is bedside pulmonary function test static lung volumes and capacities like work vital capacity inspiratory capacity etc then dynamic lung volumes like fvc fvv1 you all know about that gas exchange tests are the second ones like alveolar arterial po2 gradient diffusion capacity of the lung and then gas distribution test like single breath nitrogen test multiple breath nitrogen test helium dilution method and radio xenon scintigram there are certain cardio pulmonary interactions that is qualitative test like history examination and detailed abg or there can be quantitative test like 6 minute walk test stair climbing test shuttle walk and then cardio pulmonary exercise testing let us go one by one bedside pulmonary function test this is commonly asked with the examiners always ask and they are fond of asking these type of questions what is sabres breath holding test it is that when you ask the patient to take a full but not too deep breath and hold it as long as possible then this test is performed more than 25 seconds it is normal cardiopulmonary reserve test reserve 
and that is 15 to 25 seconds is a limited cardiopulmonary reserve less than 15 it is very poor cardiopulmonary reserve this means that the contraindications for the elective surgery if you go further there is a schneider's match blowing test <clears throat> it is a it measures maximum breathing capacity ask the patient to blow a match stick from a distance of six inches with the mouth wide open chin rested and supported no per slipping no hand movement no air movement in the room mouth and match at the same level then if the patient cannot blow out a match then it is the uh, lesson and if it is a maximum breathing if you see that if it is a maximum breathing capacity is less than 60 liters per minute and fev1 is less than 1.6 liters this interpretation you should all know about these tests able to blow if the patient is able to blow out the match then it is more than 60 liters and more than fev1 is more than 1.6 liters modified match test is the increase the distance was increased to nine inches then it was thought that the um, the maximum breathing capacity is maximum breathing capacity is more than 150 liter per minute when the patient is able to blow out the match and in the three uh, inches uh, distance it is equal to 40 more than 40 liters per minute then there is a cuff test that is deep breath for is taken followed by the cuff the patient is able to cuff this means we have to see about the strength and the effectiveness if there is inadequate cuff this means the forced vital capacity is less than 20 ml per kg fev1 is less than 15 ml per kg and pefr is peak expiratory flow rate is less than 200 ml per minute a wet productive cuff or self propagated paroxysms of cuffing this patient is susceptible for pulmonary complication then there is a forced expiratory time after deep breath exhale maximally and forcefully and then keep the stethoscope over the trachea and listen if there is a normal forced expiratory time <clears throat> it is three to five seconds when there is a obstructed lung disease then it is more than six seconds if it is restrictive lung disease that it is less than three seconds this means the ask the patient to after the deep breath the ask the patient to exhale maximally and forcefully that is the major thing which has to be measured in this forced, forced expiratory time then there is a single breath count that is after deep breath hold it and start counting till the next breath normally it is 30 to 40 counts this indicates the vital capacity of the patient. Then there is a, another test which with the use of right respir respirometry. It measures the tidal volume or minute ventilation. It is normally 15 seconds times uh, 4. And simple and rapid test. Instrument is compact, light and portable. But disadvantage is it under reads at low flow rates and over reads at high flow rates. So cannot be connected to endotracheal tube or face mask. This is another limitation. Then poor explanation, the prior explanation to the patient is required. Ideally done in the sitting position. Minute ventilation, for minute ventilation, the instrument record for one minute and read directly. And for tidal volume, it is calculated by dividing the minute ventilation by the respiratory rate. Accurate measurement is range of 3.7 to 20 liters per minute. There is a right peak flow meter. This measures the PEFR, that is peak expiratory flow rate. Normally in males, it is 450 to 700 liters per minute. And in females, it is 300 to 500 liters per minute. If it is less than 200 liters per minute, this means there is an inadequate cuff efficiency. And this gives the measure of your pulmonary function test. There is a Debono's whistle test. Debono whistle blowing test is it measures the PEFR. And uh, in this, the patient blows down a wide bore tube at the end of which is there is a whistle. On the side, it is there is a hole with the adjustable knob. As the subject blows, whistle blows, 
leak hole is gradually increased till the intensity of the whistle disappears. At the last position at which the whistle cannot be blown, the PEFR can be read off on the scale. There are other bedside pulmonary function tests like microspirometers, which measures the vital capacity, bedside pulse, pulse oximetry or ABGs. Then the, if you move further, there are stacking lung volumes and capacities. Let's discuss these lung volumes and capacities. If you see the pressure volume relationship of the lung, normally the pressure needed to keep the lung inflated at a certain volume is called the transpulmonary pressure. And then alveolar pressure is the same throughout the lung. And the more the negative intrapleural pressure at the apex results in larger, more distended apical alveoli than in other areas of the lung. The transpulmonary pressure is greater at the top and lower at the bottom. So the lower lung resections regions, they expand more for the given increase in transpulmonary pressure than the upper units. Thus, ventilation goes preferably to the lower lung regions. So for static lung volumes and capacities, spirometry is the cornerstone of all PFT, PFTs. John Hutchinson invented the spirometer. You all know you have spirometry in your uh, machines also. Spirometry is the medical test that measures the volume of air an individual inhales or exhales as a function of time. It can't measure FRC, residual volume or total lung capacity. Remember this. So good start of the test is that the acceptability criteria is it should be done without any hesitation. No cuffing, no glottic closure, no variable flow, no early uh, termination more than 10, 6 seconds, no air leaks, reproducibility is that the test is without excessive variability. Two largest values for FVC and the force vital capacity and the two largest values for FEV1 should vary by no more than 0.2 liters. Then it is a good test. Then what constitutes the normal spirometry interpretation? This is the normal value which is given. Uh, may vary and depend upon height which is directly proportional. This means when the height is more then the interpretation which changes. Then age, it is inversely proportional. With the age, the spirometry, ch the changes are visible on the other side. Gender and ethnicity. If you see this the lung volume and capacity diagram, this you all know, you must have read in somewhere or the other, in one book or the other. These are the pulmonary function tests with lung volume and capacities. This clearly mentions when the spirometry is done, how the capacities and volumes are calculated through this diagram. This diagram, you all must know how to draw this diagram because sometimes in the theory paper of the basic sciences, this diagram comes as a pulmonary function test. So basically it is uh, whenever there is, the tidal volume can vary and a lung capacity is a combination of more than one lung volume. So if you see the total lung capacity, it is a combination of functional residual capacity plus the inspiratory capacity. That you can see that fun functional residual volume, IC plus FRC is the total lung capacity. So it is basically the main aim is that uh, the main crux is that the uh, capacities, lung capacities are combination of more than one lung volumes. The PFT tracings, if you see that there are have it has four lung volumes like tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume, and residual volume. Then five capacities are there: inspiratory capacity, expiratory capacity, vital capacity, and functional residual capacity with total lung capacity. Addition of two or more lung volumes comprise a capacity. If you see this in this diagram, if you see the lung volumes, there is a tidal volume. It is a normal volume of air exhaled and inhaled. With each breath, 
during quiet breathing. Quiet breathing, that is more important. Approximately 6 to 8 ml per kg, you all know. Inspiratory reserve volume. It is a maximum volume of air inhaled from the end inspiratory tidal position. So it is around 3000 ml. This is IRV. Here my arrow goes on in the diagram. Then we have expiratory reserve volume. That is maximum volume of air that can be exhaled from the resting and expiratory tidal position that is 1500. If you see that 1500 ml, this is the ERV. This means the patient has exhaled the full, but after that there is some amount of air which that patient can exhale more. That is the maximum amount of air that can be exhaled after that. So that is around 1500 ml. Residual volume is 1000 ml or 1200 ml. This is volume of air remaining in the lungs after maximum exhalation. After the maximum exhalation, whatever amount is left in the lungs that is called as residual volume. Indirectly measured, it is the functional residual capacity minus ERV expired reserve volume. This means it is the residual volume. It cannot be measured by the spirometer. Then there are capacities, that is the lung capacities. If you see this diagram, total lung capacity is sum of all the volume compartments or volume of air in the lungs after maximum inspiration. So the patient has taken the maximum inspiration. After that, all the volumes, if you add, that is comprising of total lung capacity. It is around 4 to 6 liters. Then we have the vital capacity, that is TLC minus total lung capacity minus residual volume. That is maximum volume of air exhaled from the maximum inspiratory level. That is, if you inspire maximally, and then after that, there is a maximum amount of air which is to be exhaled, that is around 60 to 70 ml per kg, the, or it is 5000 ml total. It is the vital capacity, which is called as uh, VC. Then we have inspiratory capacity, that is sum of IRV and tidal volume, or the maximum volume of air that can be inhaled from the end expiratory tidal position. Expiratory capacity can be easily calculated with tidal volume plus ERV. Then we have the lung, lung capacities. We have functional residual capacity. It is sum of residual volume plus ERV or the volume of air in the lungs at end expiratory tidal position. That is 2500 ml. If you see that, this is the FRC that is more important for during the oxygenation functional residual capacity. It decreases by supine position, obese patients and induction of anesthesia by 16 to 20%. So remember this, FRC decreases with these factors. <clears throat> what is the function of FRC? It is the oxygen store. So buffer for maintaining a steady arterial PO2, then partial inflation helps preventing the atelectasis, minimizes the work of breathing. Because more the FRC, less is the work of breathing. That is more beneficial. Next is how to measure the FRC or tidal vol residual volume. It can be measured by nitrogen washout technique, helium dilution technique method, or body plethysmography. So nitrogen washout technique is when the patient breathes 100% oxygen and all the nitrogen in the lungs is washed out. The exhaled volume and the nitrogen concentration in that volume are measured. And the difference in the nitrogen volume at the initial concentration and at the final exhaled concentration, it allows a calculation of intrathoracic volume, usually FRC. The difference is FRC. Then there is a helium dilution technique. Patient breathes in and out from the reservoir with knowledge of uh, knowing the volume of gas containing trace of helium. Now helium gets diluted by the gas previously present in the lungs. 
that is if 50 per 50 ml of helium is introduced and the helium concentration is 1% then volume of lung is 5 liters so this is how it is calculated that how much ml of helium is introduced how much helium concentration is there in there in percentage and then volume of lung you have to calculate accordingly so body plethysmography is the last one plethysmography is the greek word means enlargement based on the principle of boyle's law that is pressure into volume is constant the principal advantage over other two methods is that it quantifies non communicating gas volumes a patient is placed in the sitting position in the closed body box with a known volume the patient pants with the, an open glottis against a closed shutter to produce the changes in the box pressure proportionate to the volume of air in the chest as the measurements done at end of the expiration it yields frc then we have next we come to the dynamic lung volumes or force spirometry this force spirometry or timed expiratory spirogram is it includes measuring of the pulmonary mechanics to assess the ability of the lungs to move larger volume of air quickly through the airways to identify the airway obstruction this is forced vital capacity fev1 several fevfs values and then forced inspiratory rates or mvv <clears throat> forced vital capacity is the maximum volume of air that can be breathed out as forcefully and rapidly as possible following a maximum inspiration it is characterized by full inspiration to tlc followed by the total lung capacity followed by abrupt onset of expiration to the residual volume indirectly it reflects low flow resistance property of the airways this diagram is very important you have to make this diagram in most of the places whenever these type of pfts are asked in the question and you can see that this whole diagram shows when the graph which is like this which goes till the plateau and then it makes the plateau around 4 liters and if you see that FVC that is the functional vital capacity is uh, for, uh, forced vital capacity is 4.33. So this diagram shows each and everything which is to be mentioned whenever you need the PFTs. FVC if you uh, calculate this and then interpret it in the percentage 80 to 120 percent of the FVC is normal. If it comes to 70 to 79, it is a mild reduction. 50 to 69, it is the moderate reduction. And less than 50 is the severe reduction. Then measurements obtained from the FVC curve and their significance is, there are certain things you can calculate from this graph. This is the force expiratory volume in one second. It is the volume exhaled during the first second of the fvc maneuver when you do the force vital capacity maneuver the first second is the most important thing where the volume is exhaled maximum this is calculated as fe1 v1 force expiratory volume in one second it measures the general severity of the airway obstruction and normally it is 3 to 4.5 liters then FEV1 decreased, decreases in both obstructive and restrictive lung diseases. That is if the patient's vital capacity is smaller than predicted force expiratory volume at one second. Another important is FEV1 upon FVC ratio. It is reduced in the obstructive disorders. Interpretation of this percentage predicted is if it is more than this ratio is more than 75%, it is normal. 60 to 75 there is a mild obstruction and 50 to 59 is a moderate and less than 49 it is a severe obstruction now measurements obtained from fvc curve and their significance is if you see this table whenever there is obstructive disease uh, then the fvc decreases fvv1 is decreased and the ratio also decreases when there are stiff lungs 
then it is FVC is decreased, FEV1 is decreased or normal. On FVC, FEV1 upon FVC ratio is normal. And respiratory muscle weakness is there, then both FVC and FEV1 is decreased, but the ratio is normal. So normal tracing following the FEV1, FVC is that it is more than 4 liters and then the important thing is interpretation of the office respirometry is that in the obstructive pattern is if this ratio is below 70% then if it is there then see FEV1 is above 80% of the predicted or then it is a borderline obstruction. If not, then it is 65 to 80% of the predicted, then it is mild obstruction. And when it is 50 to 64% of the predicted, then it is a moderate obstruction. FVC below 80% of the predicted is obstruction plus low vital capacity. Let's move further then. In the restrictive, restrictive diseases, the graph goes like this and the FEV1 decreases and FVC also decreases and the ratio also decreases. So if you see that, if you see these three graphs, <clears throat> these three graphs, they, there is a, in the obstructive, there is a slow rise, reduced volume expired and then prolonged time to full expiration. In the restricted one, there is a fast rise to plateau at reduced maximum volume and in the mixed one there is a slow rise to the reduced maximum volume measures the static lung volumes and full PFTs are required to confirm. The forced mid expiratory flow rate is 25 to 75 percent which can be measured from this graph. It is a maximum flow rate it is said that the maximum flow rate during the mid expiratory part of FVC maneuver is during this period. It is measured in liter per second, then may reflect effort dependent expiration and independent expiration and the status of the small airways. On the graph, you can see that there is a slope of line which reflects the FEV, FEF 25 to 75%. This is the this highest point which is effort independent expiration and normal volume is 4.5 to 5 liters per second or 300 liters per minute. Interpretation is if it is more than 60 percent it is normal, 40 to 60 percent it is mild obstruction, 20 to 40 percent is moderate obstruction and less than 40 is the 20 is the severe obstruction. Then the next one is the peak expiratory flow rates. It is the maximum flow rate during an forced vital capacity maneuver that occurs in initial 0.1 second. After a maximal inspiration, the patient expires as forcefully and quickly as he can <clears throat> and the maximum flow rate of air is measured. Normally it is 200 to 1200 ml of FVC, but it gives a crude estimation of the lung function and reflecting the larger airway function. This can be measured with peak flow meter. You can see in this diagram photograph. The peak flow rate in normal adult is 400 to 700 liters per minute in males, 3 to 500 liter per minute in females. And if it is less than 200, this means there is impaired cuffing and hence post-op complications can be there. Then there is a maximum vital a voluntary ventilation, maximum voluntary ventilation or maximum breathing capacity. This is the, this measures speed and efficiency of filling and emptying of lungs during increased inspiratory effort. Maximum volume of air that can be breathed in and out of the, in the one minute by maximum voluntary effort. It reflects the peak ventilation in physiological demands and it is normally 150 to 175 liters per minute. Then this maximum, uh, the subject is asked to breathe as quickly and as deeply as possible for 12 seconds. And the measured volume is extrapolated to one minute. 
the periods longer than 15 seconds should not be allowed because prolonged hyperventilation leads to fainting due to excessive lowering of arterial PCO2 and H plus ions. So maximum voluntary ventilation is markedly decreased in patients with emphysema, airway obstruction, poor respiratory muscle strength. Then there is a physiological determinants of the maximum flow rates. You have to see the degree of effort. What is the driving pressure generated by the maximum muscle contraction? Elastic recoil pressure of lung. That is the uh, tendency to recoil or collapse. Then the pressure increases from residual volume to total lung capacity. And then the third one is the airway resistance. How much is the airway resistance? This is told by the determined by the caliber of the airways, which determines as the lung volume as it increases and the raw high at the residual volume and low at the, uh, the resistance increases at residual volume and low at the total lung capacity. Then the further we move to the flow volume loops and detection of airway obstruction. It is reflected by the spirogram that is the graphic analysis of flow at various lung volumes. The tracings are obtained when the maximal force expiration from total lung capacity to the residual volume is followed by maximal forced inspiration back to the total lung capacity. It measures the forced inspiratory and expiratory flow rate and augments the spirometry results. Principal advantage of flow volume loops is it identifies the probably obstructive flow anatomical location. It tells where is the exactly the location present. Uh, volume uh, obstruction is there. First one third of the expiratory flow is effort dependent and in each final two third is near the residual volume is effort independent and inspiratory curve is entirely dependent. So it is always important how to generate this. This is the effort independent flow. And if you see, this is the normal curve. Below one is an inspiratory flow. Upper one is the expiratory flow. Then flow volume loops can tell you the fixed obstruction. There is a constant air flow limitation on inspiration and expiration. Then it is a fixed obstruction such as there is a benign stricture, goiter, endotracheal neoplasms, or there can be bronchial stenosis. If you see this curve, it has a constant obstruction in both in the inspiration and expiration. It can be compared from the normal curve. If you see this. Next is the when there is a variable intrathoracic obstruction, flattening of the expiratory limb, that is tracheomalacia, poly polychondritis, tumors of trachea, or in the brain bronchus. If you see that, it has a, during forced expiration, there is a high pleural pressure, increased intrathoracic pressure, decreases the airway diameter. And the low, uh, the flow volume loop shows a greater reduction in the expiratory phase. You can see this. In the uh, cursor, you can see this. It decreases from the normal. This is normal and this decreases during the expiration. And during the inspiration, the lower pleural pressure ground around the airway tends to decrease the obstruction it uh, decrease it increases little bit but not much then there is variable extra thoracic obstruction so there can be various reasons like osa airway burns then bilateral vocal cord paralysis vocal cord constriction in this you can see that this one is a normal one there is a forced inspiration and negative intra uh, transmuscular pressure inside the airway tends to collapse it Expiration, it a positive pressure in airway decreases the obstruction. It may increase the amplitude increases. And in the inspiratory flow, it is reduced to the greater extent than the expiratory flow. So it reduces from here, if you see this. So you have to remember these pressure loops because it can be asked in the exams. Then we have obstructive pattern that is uh, in asthma and COPD. In asthma, you can see that there is air flow reduces rapidly with the reduction in the lung volumes because the airways are narrow and loop becomes concave. This is what happens from this is normal one, upper one, and lower one. You can see that there is 
the air flow reduces rapidly and the, the amplitude decreases and the concavity may be the indicator of there is a concavity here and this is the indicator of air flow obstruction the more the air flow obstruction is there it, the graph it has a more the concavity is there and it may present before the change in the fev1 or fev1 upon FVC. If you see this, compare these two diagrams, you can easily diagnose the asthma. Then emphysema, in emphysema, airways may collapse during the forced expiration because of destruction of the supporting lung tissue and they cause very reduced flow at low lung volumes and characteristic appearance to the flow volume curve. You can see this, there is a uh, different volume curve and this is the characteristic of the emphysema in the patients of emphysema. This is a normal one and this has a dog leg type of curve. Then there is a restrictive pattern of flow volume loops. The total, if you see this, it is characterized by reduced lung volumes or decreased lung compliance. And it examples are in fibrosis, then there can be scoliosis, obesity, lung resection, etc. And in this, what happens is <clears throat> there, are, there is a low total lung capacity, low functional residual capacity, low residual volume, FVC may be low, all the capacities and residual volumes decrease, and the peak expiratory flow may be preserved or even higher than predicted, leads to taller steeper and narrow flow volume loop in the expiratory phase. This longer one shows that it has a, this is a high peak expiratory flow and this shows that during expiration it increases and this is characteristic of the restricted pattern. Then we have certain gas exchange function tests. In this AADO2, that is the more important, that is oxygen, art, alveolar arterial oxygen tension gradient. You can always calculate from your ABGs also. It is a sensitive indicator of detecting the regional VQ inequality. And normally it is the 8 mm, which is up to 25 mm in eighth decade. And a abnormal high values at the room air is seen in asymptomatic smokers or chronic bronchitis. And this gradient can be calculated as alveolar pressure of oxygen and pressure of the arterial oxygen the difference between these two that you can calculate with the aa gradient then there is test for gas exchange function which is most important is diffusing capacity this is rate at which the gas enters the blood dividing divided by its driving pressure that is a gradient alveolar and and expiratory tensions capillary tensions and it measures the ability of lungs to transport the inhaled gas from the alveoli to the pulmonary capillaries. Means how much air comes to the alveoli and then it is transported to the pulmonary capillaries through the endothelial membrane. Normally it is 20 to 30 ml per minute per millimeter of mercury and depends on thickness of the alveolar capillary membrane, hemoglobin concentration and cardiac output. If you see this, the diffusing capacity of lung DL, that is estimates the transfer of oxygen from alveolar gas to the red cells. And this is the formula you should remember how it is calculated. A is the area and T is the thickness and D is the, this is the driving pressure. And it is measured by single breath method and normally it is 20 to 30 ml per minute per millimeter of mercury. This is the diagram which you should remember and it is present in all the books, you can see that. So causes of decreased uh, is, uh, the causes of decreased diff diffusing capacity is emphysema, then low low resection, then bronchial obstruction, anemia, and there is a <clears throat> decreased thickness of the alveolar capillary membrane is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, sarcoidosis, asbestosis, and congestive heart failure. There can be miscellaneous other causes like high carbon monoxide, back pressure from smoking, then pregnancy and ventilation, perfusion mismatch. There are tests for gas exchange functions, single breath test using carbon monoxide 
The patient is asked to inspire a dilute mixture of carbon monoxide and hold the breath for seconds. Carbon monoxide is taken up in is determined by the infrared analysis and calculated accordingly to the formula which is given there. And totally, why carbon monoxide is used? Because it has a high affinity for carbon hemoglobin, which is approximately 200 times that of CO2, so it does not rapidly build up in plasma. Under normal conditions, it has low blood concentration, uh, low blood concentration equivalent to zero. Therefore, pulmonary concentration is also zero. So this I have already explained you. There are certain tests of cardiopulmonary reserve also. This is the simple test of stair climbing and six minute walk test. If the simple test and easy to perform with minimal equipment, if the patient, according to the flight of stairs, the patient can go that vital, uh, the capacity uh, that is measured and uh, the interpretation is what is the mortality afterwards, pneumonectomy, what is the post of morbidity that can be there, this can be easily seen on this diagram, uh, this table. There is a shuttle walk test, that is that patient walks between cones 10 meters apart with the increasing pace, the subject walks until they cannot make it from cone to cone between the beeps. And the shuttle walk of 350 meters correlates with the VO2 maximum of 11 ml per kg per minute. Cardiopulmonary exercise testing is a non-invasive technique and it, it is the test ability, it is used for test ability of subjects, physiological response to cope with the metabolic demands. Then there are certain basic physiological principles in which the exercising muscle gets energy from three sources, you all know. And then you have to see with incremental increase in exercise, expired minute volume and oxygen consumption per minute and carbon dioxide production per minute increases. So you have to measure, what to measure is the anaerobic threshold, maximum oxygen utilization, a ventilatory equivalent to oxygen, and oxygen pulse and ventilatory equivalent of carbon dioxide. This is the normal which you have to know, which is given the brackets. Last is the preoperative assessment of the thoracotomy. As assessment of the lung function in the thoracotomy patients. As an anesthesiologist, our goal is to identify the patients at risk of increased post-op morbidity and mortality, to identify the patients who need short-term or long-term post-op ventilatory support, Lung resection may be followed by inadequate gas exchange, pulmonary hypotension, and incapacitating dyspnea. So the measurement of predicted post-op FEV1 and the, uh, diffusing lung capacity is measured. According to the lobes, it is calculated how the patient, which lung is resected, how much uh, the lung portion is resected, and accordingly with the CT scan of the chest, we can calculate with the, uh, the post-operative predicted FEV1 and the rest of the things. If the post-operative FEV1 percent predicted is more than 40, this means basically this tells you how much respiratory complications are anticipated post-operatively. So this table gives you the digits less than 40, more than 40, less than 30, that yes, whether the surgery management is required, whether the surgery will benefit the post-op ventilation, whether the surgery will cause more respiratory complications or not. So this table you can remember later on, basically because it is used to assess the lung function of the thoracotomy patients post-operatively. In addition to history examination, chest X-ray, PFTs, pre-operative evaluation includes ventilation perfusion, scintigraphy, CT scan, split lung function test. These are all methods which can tell you how to go with the post-operative respiratory situation of the lungs. Then there are certain combination tests. There is no single test measures. That is the gold standard in predicting the post-op complications. So there was a three-legged stool is given. This is the respiratory mechanics, cardiopulmonary reserve, lung parenchymal function, all these three are combined together some way or the other, then it will tell you what is the prediction of post-operative complications.
so inter let us do the interpretation of the pfts in the last whenever you see the flow volume curve available examine the flow volume curve is there any loss in the area is the fvc is normal or reduced is the contour normal or scooped is the slope of fv is being increased is there any major airway lesion this is i am teaching you how to interpret from the flow volume curve the step 2 is examine the fev1 value normal or reduced by more than 15 to 20% examine the fev1 upon fvc ratio now normal or decreased to 75% or increased examine the expiratory flow values fev1 25 to 75% is decreased then examine the mvv and normal is fev1 into 40 and if it is decreased with fev1 it is obstructive disease if it is decreased with the fev1 restrictive disease if it is decreased with the normal fev1 then it is the poor patient performance or neuromuscular disorder or major airway lesion step 6 is examine the response to bronchodilator is the response normal is the response decreased examine the diffuse lung capacity of the carbon monoxide it is normal or reduced if it is reduced then it is a characteristic of pulmonary parenchymal restrictive disorders if it is increased it is a hemorrhage or polycythemia examine the other test results also so this is how you can diagnose and carry your messages pulmonary function test act only to support and exclude a diagnosis a combination of a thorough history and physical examination as well as supporting the lab data and imaging is helpful in developing an anesthetic plan for patients with pulmonary dysfunctions detailed knowledge of pfts help in prevention of complications and guide us to formulate the strategy before the patient surgery and post operative course of actions thank you i uh, say so your speaker is off switch on your speaker dr lakesh good morning so i think good morning to everybody and uh, it good is morning. very important it is very important topic i have already mentioned in the chats that for the post graduates this topic is very important because uh, in detail it is asked on the table by us in detail it is asked in the theory as a short question is a long question for 10 marks question and this uh, is the much wanted topic always you can't ex escape from this topic in the respiratory system and uh, over to dr lakesh now lakesh sir your speaker is off it is still off can you switch it on sir please sir please uh, unmute yourself so you are still muted now is all right yes sir yes sir now we can yeah, yeah. hear yes yeah, yeah. so as uh, dr manpreet is highlight each, each and every aspect of uh, the pulmonary function test is not a very simple topic and is a huge battery of tests are there and understanding of each and every test according to the patient and their disease process and what procedure they are going to is very important to consider this uh, uh, aspects then only we can have the information utilize for that particular patient for benefit and for post graduate it is very important topic and not so easy you have to require understood each and every aspect thank you very much dr manpreet for highlighted each and every aspect now uh, the topic uh, is open for questions if uh, organizers allow for 
मैक्सिम एयर फ्लो लिमिटेशन अकर्स इन द एक्सपीरेशन एंड इट इज ड्यूरिंग द एक्सपीरेशन द प्यूरल प्रेशर बिकम्स पॉजिटिव एंड दैट इज द इट इज रिलेटिव टू द इंटरलिमिनल एयर प्रेशर सो बेसिकली यू कैन जज फ्रॉम द प्रेशर वॉल्यूम लूप्स हाउ द ऑब्स्ट्रक्शन इज वेदर इट इज इन द इंट्राथोरेसिक वेदर इट इज द एक्स्ट्राथोरेसिक हाउ द इट वेरिएस वेरीज फ्रॉम द नॉर्मल सो बेसिकली आई वॉन्ट टू से इज दैट यू हैव टू स्टडी इन डिटेल in a small lecture you can't understand each and everything that is also online there are certain